Well, if you have your Bibles today, I don't have a lot of scripture on the screen, but you can listen intently. And we'll be in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 3 today. And I have a map for you coming up next. And in order to help us understand context, I need to take just a few minutes and put everything in its proper pigeonhole. So what we know from the book of Exodus and uh, also in Numbers, that the Israelites came across the Red Sea on dry ground. All of you know that story. Great crossing of the Red Sea. Um, the, is, the Egyptians blessed them with so much food and stuff, it lasted them about two months. And then at the two-month mark, more or less, the Israelites start to complain. Now remember, they have gone from being a free people to a slave people. And so they're dependent as slaves for everything. And at the two-month mark, they go to Moses and say, we are sick of this trip. At least we had meat in uh, Egypt. So God gives them manna and quail. And about six months later, more or less, they end up at Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up to the mount, and God gives him the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments, five on each side. Have no other gods before me, all those things. And then they uh, go a little bit further, and Moses says, let's send some spies up into the promised land. And now this is probably about six months, eight months into their journey. And let me just describe it by states. Now, this is not how it was, but just to give you a visual picture. Let's suppose that uh, uh, Missouri is Egypt, and they cross the Mississippi River on dry ground. And they come into Illinois for about six months. Let's say that's where Mount Sinai is. And, and what, the Bible has several places that are just absolutely hilarious. And one of them is, he's up there on the mount, and Aaron is down there with the people, and they say, hey, when's, when's Moses coming back? And, you know, instead of being this great man of faith, what does he say? Uh, I'm not sure when he's coming back, and he didn't. And so they make this golden calf out of their rings and their gold and their earrings and everything. Moses comes down, and what does he find? But this golden calf, and people are worshiping it. And he looks at his brother Aaron and says, what's going on? He said, I don't know. We threw the gold into the fire and out came this calf. Well, he wasn't just mad because of that response, but because of the lack of faith of the Israelites and his brother and sister. So he destroys that, beats it into little pieces, so small that he puts it in water and then makes the people drink it. Imagine the grit. Just a reminder, that this is not the way we serve God. And he smashes the two tablets, goes up and gets two more tablets, and then they come down and they travel a little further. Now, let's just imagine it was this way, because it gives us a context of distance. I mean, not quite, but you'll get the idea. So they come across the Mississippi River. They come into Illinois to Mount Sinai. They travel a little further into Indiana, and then they get down to Kentucky, and they're in the Ohio River Valley, okay? And um, Moses says, the promised land is Ohio. Now, we all know that, right? It's not Michigan. Michigan. I got to tell you, this is a true story. True story, I swear it is. But some of you remember Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey was a great commentator. commentator. And one day on the radio, I heard him say this. Somebody was describing the state of Michigan before statehood, explorers, and going on and on about how this is the worst possible place to live. It's the most hostile, and nobody would ever want to live there. And he said it was the state of, that became Michigan. So we say, well, that makes sense to us as Buckeyes, doesn't it? Sure it does. So they're, they're down in Kentucky, and they're on the other side of uh, the Ohio River, 
And Moses gets this idea, let's send 12 spies into Ohio, the promised land, and let's find out what's up there. Now remember, they're only the, they have only been on this journey less than a year, more like eight months. And as yeah. they send the 12 spies, they come back after 40 days and say this, it is incredible what this place is. The promised land you've described is absolutely incredible. The grapes are the size of softballs. I mean, it's wonderful. There's so much vegetation, so much food, but there's a problem. Their cities are very thick, walled cities. They're, they have giants in the land, and we're scared to death to go. And we think they look at us as grasshoppers, and this is one of the funniest things too, and we look at ourselves as grasshoppers in their eyes as well. Now, you can't conquer very much if you view yourself as small and a grasshopper, right? So Moses and God get so angry with them because of their lack of faith that he says, for each day of the 40 days that you were there exploring, you're going to wander in this wilderness of Kentucky, Tennessee, 40 years, one for each day that you were there. So they do that, and they wander for 40 years. And you might say, why 40? This is just my opinion, and I could have it wrong, and this is not a reflection on older people, because I am one, almost 70, okay? But I think God let them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years so that the older generation would die off because of their lack of faith. Because they were the generation that came out of Egypt complaining. And I'd like to think that the younger generation saw how God judged that. And they became the generation that when Caleb and uh, Joshua come out of that land, the only two of the 12 spies, and says, we can do it. We can take this place. It's ours. If God wants us to have it, we should go right now. And the people rose up against Moses and Aaron and Miriam and Joshua and Caleb. Now, everybody's heard that story in one way or another, but they wander around in Tennessee and Kentucky for 40 years, and the 40 years is over, and they've come up on the east side of Ohio somewhere, and what we're looking at where it says Moab, just, just imagine, if you would, that that's Ohio, and that, Jeric uh, that, uh, that the Ohio River's up there somewhere, and so this is at the end of the 40 years, and in this third chapter of the book of Joshua, they are coming up to cross the Jordan River. Now, the younger people, and it have to be the in-between guys, because even if you do the logistics of 40 years, the older people, not all of them, of course, but many of them have died off because of age, and then, or maybe it's just walking every day for 40 years. I mean, that might do it. And then there's an in-between group who are learners. They see what God's up to, and they start to follow God. And then you've got the younger generation who really is only being modeled to by that generation. And so they're kind of in, not in the know, but they know enough to follow God where he's leading and all that kind of stuff. So they come up and cross the Ohio River in the same way that they'd cross the Mississippi River on dry ground. Now, when they get across the river on dry ground, the next city that they find is Jericho. And you know, going around the walls of Jericho, blowing the horns, the walls fall down, all that. And they mistakenly think, their military leaders think, we, this, is, this was pretty easy, God took care of us. So they went to the next city called Ai, said, let's, do, let's use the same strategy. Didn't work. Because they didn't rest upon God and follow what he wanted for that city. So today, the only way we can really set the entire context is to read the entirety of the third chapter. Now, it's not real long, but all this Mississippi River, wander around, Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments, the Golden Calf, came up in reconnaissance and looked up into uh, the beautiful Ohio Valley, and then they come back. They don't go. Forty years later, they're on the other side of the river, on the east side, crossing into the west side of Palestine. And we're in the third chapter of Joshua. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan River 
where they camped before crossing over. And after three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant, now, again, I like to keep things simple. I like to have visual pictures. Most of you at one time or another have seen Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark. The picture you see of that gold box with the angels facing each other and all that, that's the Ark of the Covenant. That is a beautiful, beautiful uh, model of what that would have been size-wise and everything else. And for the Israelites, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. That's why it's so important to them. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. So here's the picture. You've got two and a half to three million, you don't have to put it back, two and a half to three million people over on the east side of the Ohio River coming up. And then you've got the Ark of the Covenant is going to lead them across. And they said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant <coughs> going toward the river, the Jordan River, then you follow along. You'll know this is which way to go since you've never been this way before, but keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark, 10 football fields, just to give you an idea, perspective. Don't go near it. Then Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. Because he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a huge heap at a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. That's about 25 miles away, more or less. Then we finish the chapter. In the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the sea, the salt sea, the great salt sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed over until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, Father in heaven, today we have gathered in your house. We have not been entertained by good worship. We have been led by good worship. And if we wanted to, we could join in. We could sing the words from our heart, and so many did. We gave of our offerings. We gave of our very lives, our, our work, our benefit, our income, and we've prayed. And as we come to the Word of God today, it seems to me that out of these words in this third chapter of, of Joshua, it gives us several directives, what we should take from this, what we should look at and say, how's that apply to me, to our church, to our pastor, to the future, to what he's done in the past? How should we look at all of this? And though it's historically true what happened, as is often the case in the Word of God, it has something for us for today and tomorrow. And I pray for the kind attention of your people, for the preaching and teaching and living out the Word of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Today I have a message for you simply entitled, At the Crossroads of Change. Now all of us know that change is inevitable. Just about the time we think we've got everything lined out, we've got the last puzzle piece to put in the puzzle, something happens and things change. If you're, a, and I really liked how Lori prayed today. So many students who have found the routine, I'm a bus driver, and we have this routine. I can, if I'm running on time and I don't get stopped by a train or something, I'm at a person's house within a minute of my appointed time every day. The kids stand out, they know I'm going to be there every day at the same time. It's a routine. And you move on up through school. And the seniors and juniors and whoever have had this routine. All their friends are there. They're athletics. I, I took a load of kids to, a busload of kids to Defiance for the, the uh, sectional track meet. They ran in the rain for two and a half hours, pouring down rain. When they got on the bus, they were drowned rats. Didn't bother them at all. Nobody complained. We stopped in Collider for ice cream. It was all good. You know, that's just how it is. But the day's coming pretty quickly when mom's not going to say, okay, it's time to get up for school, or their Apple watch goes off, or whatever happens, and they're going to be thrown out of their routine. Now, they know this is coming. They know change is coming, and some of them are very prepared. They're going into the military. They're going to go to college. They're going to go to the same kind of routine, except there won't be anybody begging them for homework. They will just have to do the work, and they'll have to develop their own schedule and their own process. And so many of them are in fact prepared for the changes that are coming. But I'd like to think there's a pretty good group of them. And there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with life. But as they get dumped into the adult life and they don't have the routine that is so easy to get used to, a change is coming. And uh, for some of them, it's going to be quite rude. But that's okay. That happened to you and me as we grew up. And so today, we look at the crossroads of change and four directives that are clearly found in our text today. And here's the first. Um, Joshua tells them to prepare themselves or get ready. Change is coming. We've been in this thing for 40 years, and I can't imagine. I mean, that's over, that's over half of my adult life, uh, half of my life. And I can't imagine thinking about 40 years. I mean, I was in ministry almost 40 years. And so you think 40 years of wilderness wandering, 40 years in pastoral ministry. That's about how long it is. And I, I realized that used up a pretty good chunk of my life. And I was glad to give it. That's not the point at all. But it becomes pretty measurable. And so even though being out in the desert, setting up the tents and everything they do, in some place they'd stay a month, some place they might stay a year. They didn't stay in one place very long. They're very transient, nomadic in one sense. But now they have finally reached their, their appointed time to come across that Jordan River from the east, west over toward Jericho and Ai and the promised land that so many of them had heard about. And now it's happening. And so Joshua says, get ready, prepare yourselves, which leads us to the simple question of well, how, did, how did he tell them to do that? He said to consecrate yourself, verse 5, consecrate yourself because the Lord is going to do amazing things among you to consecrate. And I would suggest that consecrate and sanctify are, are probably almost synonyms. They may have some, some uh, variation a little bit. But to sanctify or to consecrate simply means to be set apart for God's holy purposes. So he says, if you've got something in your mind, if you've got some relationship that's not right, before we cross that river in the morning, you've got to set yourself apart for God's holy purposes. And for those who will, you will find the full joy of the amazing things that God's going to do for you, not only then and later. Joshua was calling the Israelites to abstain from anything that would take their focus off the plan of God for them. And you know, if I were you, I'd be sitting there and thinking this. That's true, Pastor. I get that. That makes sense. Consecrate, sanctify, set apart for God's holy purposes and use. And but what's that got to do with me or me? And I just, I try to keep things simple. 
God calls you and me to not only <clears throat> live in a place of sanctification and apart for God's holy purposes, but also then to be prepared at all times for wherever he may move us and whatever challenges and changes may come. And that we would say, we're ready. Now, that's like, it's not like trying to prepare for a, for a car wreck. I've been in a few car wrecks. And most of them I, I didn't see coming until it was way too late. I'm happy to say none of them were my fault. Um, but that happened so fast to be prepared. But I had my seatbelt on. I was paying attention. I wasn't eating or on a phone when it happened. So while those are simple illustrations to the idea, he calls us to be consecrated and sanctified, clean and set apart for his holy use and that was one of the things he told them to do, was to be prepared or to get ready. And that's how they were to do it. Now, the second thing that I see in this, uh, uh, this text, the second directive is he says that we need to abandon our own course. Now, I don't think it was like this, but I've served in pastoral ministry long enough to know this. That about the time the pastor, the church, the board, a committee, whoever it is, they start to chart the course for a church. And it's so predictable. It's not a negative, it's just the reality that you have in every church and every organization, you've got your early adopters. And they say, you know what, I see that. That's a good move. Well, let's, let's just talk for just a moment. I, I'm not part of the decision making here, you know that. But uh, to go to one service for the summer, okay? You've got early adopters, and early adopters say, that's just the smartest thing. That's a good idea. And then you've got middle adopters. Now, they're not with you right now. They're not critical. They're just saying, I'm not sure. You, you know, I'm just not sure about this, and that's okay because you're a middle adopter. And then there's late adopters, and the late adopters say, not only do I not see it right now, but I'm halfway through the summer, and I still don't quite get it, and I'm, I'm participating in the process that that God has given our pastors and leaders, but I'm just, but the late adopter, they're into next December, still talking about the summer. Now that doesn't make you a bad person. All I'm saying is this, that we have to abandon our own course and follow the course that God has given. And you might say, but God told me that we should do X, Y, Z. Well, then you Start visiting the sick, and you get all the messages together, and you get called out at night and be on 24-hour 20, on call. I'm just kidding, of course. But you just follow where God's leading as best you can. In our culture, we are being called to abandon our, our culture, our course. And uh, though I don't drink Bud Light or any alcoholic beverages at all. Never have been a drinker. Don't say that to say, oh, look at me. Just never drank, never smoked. I know many people have or do, but uh, there's hardly a person here that would not understand uh, the context of a Bud Light commercial. Okay. And Dylan Mulvaney. Don't need to beat that horse to death. Don't need to talk about that very long. But we all know that the, that the culture is trying to get the church and Christians to change their course. Why can't you just go with the flow of this? And we say, wait a minute, we're going to follow God. We have to abandon our course and follow his. And his is clearly written in the scriptures. Now, let's look at the third directive quickly from verse number seven. And that is to watch how God establishes leaders. It's not always true, of course. It's not true at Union Chapel, and I thank God for that. But sometimes when a pastor's at a church for a real long time, the guy that follows him is not there very long because he's not Pastor Mark. He's not Pastor Randy. He's not Pastor Alan. Okay? I was there the longest of anyone in 125 years. I was there 23 and a half years. And so the guy that followed me is a super mature, wonderful pastor. He'll probably be there 25 years too. It's, it's all good. But for Moses, you can imagine burning bush, crossing the Red Sea, striking the rock, the Ten Commandments, the gold calf, and all that God did through Moses, and he dies. And what are we going to do? And God already knows what he's going to do. 
he's going to raise up Joshua to be the next leader. Now, they're familiar with Joshua because he was Moses' primary military strategist and leader. And notice in verse 7 what it says. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Pastor Randy and myself and any pastor that's ever served or ever will serve figures this out pretty fast. That leadership is often established and measured by what leaders do in a crisis or when they have opportunity. Pastor Randy has experienced this. And so have you. You experience this in life. This isn't just about crossing the Jordan River. It's about our lives and the changes that come and how we prepare for that as best we can and realize that as leaders, as moms or dads or teachers or bus drivers or whatever we do in life, that we are leaders as Christians, that we have all experienced this. But the people of Israel were saying, okay, who's going to be the next Moses? And they already knew about Joshua. But then when he becomes the next leader, and they crossed the Jordan River under his leadership and God's direction, their minds go back to the great Mississippi River and Moses, and they come across the Red Sea, and they're doing it again. And God cements that in their mind, how he chooses leaders. Let's look at a fourth and final directive today, and that is simply to follow the presence of God. Uh, this is difficult for churches and pastors today. I think it always has been. But in our day of uh, so many resources and electronics and all the things that we do really well, um, it's still imperative that we hear the voice of God. And we still do what God wants us to. And we hear his voice in prayer and we move forward as best we understand in his timing. It's not about... And I say this graciously, but there was a time in our churches when uh, some pastors wanted a banker and a school superintendent and head football coach on their board because they were influential people. I'm not saying they couldn't and didn't do a good job, but I can tell you at Union Chapel, I had factory workers, I had a, a truck driver, I had some retired people, I had all kinds of people on the board, and I, did, I was very careful as much as I could to not have yes men on the board who would just give me whatever I wanted. They would challenge me, and times say no, and sometimes I'd be mad, but I got over it before the end of the board meeting. But after a while, they begin to follow me as I tried to follow the presence of God. And they began to see, well, the last time we crossed the river, he was there. He wasn't the primary leader. He's been with us 40 years. Now he's, we're crossing the other Jordan River with his direction and leadership. And he's following the presence of God. Verses 14 through 16 are paramount. Though I read it, I want to read it one more time quickly. The people broke camp to cross the Jordan. The priests carried the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a big heap, what a visual picture, about 25 or 30 miles away at Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. And obviously then the priests take the presence of God and the people follow the Ark of the Covenant. And it wasn't just a gold box to them. It was the presence of God. And then they came across from east to west into Palestine. They had a lot of learning to do, but they banked on the promise that God was going to take care of them, and they took those first steps. I love verse 4. I'm going to bring our thoughts to conclusion with this. In verse number 4, it says, Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. On December of 2019, let's call it the Red Sea, the Bridge Church came into being in December of 2019. You're about three and a half years old now, and you're about ready to cross the Jordan River. Changes are coming. You had a, a, a man who was leading as associate pastor, 
and he's gone another direction. And some families went with him, and that change. And now moving from two services to one, that's a good change. Uh, it's not my place to say whether it's good or bad, but I think it's practical, it's helpful. Draw the family together, keep momentum going, things like that. But you're at the same kind of stage as a church, and Pastor Randy's there too in some ways, where what happened before happens again, and God is mindful of the fact that you've never been in this place before. You've never been here. How can you know? And you say, God, I really don't know. All I know is that we are at the crossroads of change in some way, and most of that's very good. Let me tell you one other little thing that you probably know. I'm guessing Pastor Randy has said it. Uh, two things. One is that every church that exists started as a church plant. Every one of them. And every church that's a church plant goes through very predictable changes. One is it starts out like a fireworks factory, on fire, booming everywhere. Everything's going great. You got the right people, you got lots of people. But within a relatively short time, you find that there's, we're just really sick of this quail and manna. We loathe that. We want something better and different. And some of those drift away to other places. And you say, okay, that happens. It's true in every situation that when a church begins, the people who helped you start um, are not always there at the end. And instead of saying, well, look what they did. They left us. Nope. Nope. You're at the crossroads of change. And that's a positive thing. It's as predictable as the seniors who are going to graduate today and move another direction. They don't, they've never been that way before, but they know that what lies ahead is going to largely be good. And for the most part, for all of us, that has been true. So the fact that you've, you're about three and a half years old, you're going through some growing pains, you're making some changes that are necessary because of the crossroads you're at, I mostly want to encourage you to not be afraid of that. Don't view that as going backwards under Pastor Randy's leadership that's leading you forward. And finally, I want to compliment you on you guys surprising him by taking him to the park and affirming him and encouraging him a few weeks ago. Pastors need that just like everybody needs that. But he was so blessed. He, had, he was crying when he called and told me about it. I said, you are blessed to have the church family you have. But... And thus, you're at the crossroads of change. And the best thing you can do is steady the course, stay together, follow the presence of God, get across the river to the next place, which is Jericho or Ai or wherever it is, and know that whatever needs to happen, God has the interests of his church and his people in his heart. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to dismiss now. I am so very, very pleased to be able to minister the Word of God to you today and share with you my heart. It wouldn't be any secret. I mean, you don't have to be a pastor to get this. But there were times at Union Chapel, it was almost like predictable seasons that came along. About the time we'd get some momentum going, and attendance would grow and finances are strong, then something would happen. No big cataclysmic blow up, but four or five families would leave and something would happen and I'd get discouraged and other people would say, you're doing a good job, Pastor, just relax. And I'm thinking, I'm a screw up and a failure. No, you're not, but it felt that way. And so I had to learn the lesson that I was often at the crossroads of change. And that change is not our enemy. Change is where we find opportunity. And mostly, we find the presence of God. Now, Heavenly Father, I don't know what lies ahead. If things go the way I understand it, they're going to buy this property, this land. And they're going to go back to one service. They're going to gain a little momentum through the summer. And if all they do is get through the summer, that's a big thing. It's true for all churches. Summer's hard. But I pray for the faithfulness of your people during that time. I thank you for their willingness to follow their pastor, their, their Joshua. 
And Lord, though Randy or I or other pastors, we wouldn't say we're a Moses or we're a Joshua or anybody like that. In many ways, you've called us to help us prepare the people for heaven by getting consecrated, getting sanctified, set apart for your holy service, ready to go. And to realize you're developing leaders outside of the pastor here in this church and any other. You're preparing us. And sometimes it's out of opportunity and sometimes it's out of difficulty. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that your encouragement from heaven will lead and guide and the end result will be health and strength and all those puzzle pieces are here. Help everyone to just have confidence in you and in leadership and just trust that none of these things are big things, not in your sight. They're just the next things. And I pray your blessing upon Pastor Randy and Marisa and the leadership and everybody who serves. And may the blessing of the Lord rest upon the Bridge Church family today. And we'll give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.